Genshin Impact's world is brimming with powerful characters, each weaving their own captivating tales of strength and resilience. But who are the most powerful characters by lore? Well, my friends, that is why I am here to help answer this question and be warned. If you're a casual Genshin player, odds are you won't have heard of most of these people. Considering Genshin Impact's lore and Genshin Impact's current storyline with the Archon quests, I feel like two completely different games. So while there are some playable characters on my list, most of the people on here are gods of the old world, who you can really only find information about in some random book in a puddle 300 feet below the Earth's surface next to Tupac's body and Dracula's dick. It's it's really random, but, it, but they are really cool, and if you don't know about them, strap in, because the people on this list blow the current playable characters out of the water, and it isn't even close. I tried to order my list from weakest to strongest, but I also do want to point out that when it comes to things like this, it can be tough just because the lore can be so ambiguous when describing the power of some of these beings that it made it nearly impossible for me to rank some things like the Moon Sisters, who despite being one of the oldest beings in Tevat, have next to nothing when it comes to what they can and can't do. It's not like the lore is just saying, oh yeah, this nigga gets slumped by this nigga, but that nigga can also slump him. Like, that's, that isn't how it works. Furthermore, I'm also ranking everyone based on how strong they were at their peak, okay? Also, I'm not going to be ranking any of the Archons that we haven't seen enter the story yet, and that includes Farina, just because, and that's, that's just dead. So, without further ado, let's get started on who I think is the 10th strongest being in all of Tevat's history, and this is already probably going to cause some controversy. I have Rhyndoder the Great Sinner. Not to be confused with that one being who claims himself to be a sinner, Rhyndoder is or was an alchemist from Akonria who earned the moniker Gold due to her unparalleled knowledge and alchemical prowess. Her creations include the Black Dragon Durin, all the Cancer Rift Wolves you see roaming around Tevat, and two different versions of Albedo. According to Dainsleth, alchemy is what's thought to have led to Conria being nuked by Celestia, as alchemy is simply humans trying to attain a god's power, and with Rhyndoder being the best alchemist in Conria, it's easy to see just how far she was going if even the Divine had to step in and nuke Conria. Beyond this, she's also a member of the Hexen Zirkle, which, I mean, that alone should, should, should speak to her power. If you don't know what the Hexen Zirkle is, it's pretty much just a coven of the most powerful witches in all of Tevat, and there are going to be some other members of that group on the list. I say this is a controversial one just because I do have her above Nahida because when I when I was making this list, I, I, I said I was gonna do it based on how strong they were at their peak. And the problem with Nahida is Nahida was kept in a in a little cage by humans for so long that it's like it's tough to gauge just how powerful she is. I know she can do like dreams and stuff, but I think the power of creation is so strong that it feels godly to me. And Nahida having spent most of her time in a cage it, that didn't feel really godly to me. It's okay, you can you can throw your anger onto me. At number 9, I have Barbados, the God of Freedom. Barbados may have started out as a wisp, but soon turned into something even greater, as he earned his seat among the divine by helping to defeat Dekarabi and the God of Storms, with the help of others. Soon after his return, he transformed Mondstadt by reshaping the land, cutting mountains in two and throwing them into the oceans, creating the Golden Apple Archipelago. He also established the four winds to protect Mondstadt, which include the Dragon of the East, the Wolf of the North, the Lion of the South, and the Falcon of the West. Having fought in the Archon War, I think that helps push Fenty up on this list a bit, as the Archon War was essentially just a big battle royale for all the gods to duke it out over the seats of Celestia. And seeing as Venti won, and we know for a fact he has helped to slay gods, as well as doing other godly things like cutting mountains in two and, and creating whole islands, I think it makes sense that we have Venti right here. But one level above Venti, at the 8th slot, I have Beezlebub and Ball, the God of Thunder. Now, instead of having these two occupy two separate spots on the list, I thought I would just rank them as one. I mean, they are twins, so it is what it is. A and Makoto share a unique connection. Both emerged victorious in the Archon War, but A willingly sacrificed her body so Makoto could ascend to Celestia. Makoto, when she returned later, remade A's entire form, showcasing that while she isn't the fighter of the family, she is certainly not powerless. Some of the other accolades include creating the sacred Sakura and killing the god Orobashi. I say that some, but dude, that's all I could find. The lore on these two is so fucking scarce, man. It's so sad. But I, look, they're two gods, and they've done some pretty impressive things. So yeah, I do think as a combined unit, obviously they're above Venti. But it should be worth noting that while they did make the Sacred Sakura, or I should clarify, Makoto made the Sacred Sakura, and I guess A slayed Orobashi, Makoto did not do it alone, and did it with the help of a higher power, as A put it. This is gonna come into play later, so I thought I'd bring it up. But one step above the Twin Sisters, I have Rex Lapis, the God of Contracts. With a history stretching back nearly 6,000 years, Morex stands out as a legendary god for his countless defeats of other deities during the Archon War. This is just... 
This wait, when I read this list, just keep in mind he did this by himself. He defeated Osile, Ishtaha, Zhao's former master, and the god who lived in Qingsa village, and he also defended Liu Wei from countless battles. And that's just what we know about. This nigga's Kratos, bro. He's just a god killer. He's also the assumed creator of the Adepti and also created the Yakushas, which are a group of just super Adepti. Keep in mind, being over 6,000 years old, Rex Lapis is old. He is old, bro. He was alive at the same time the Celia race was alive and was even thought to be alive during the same time the second Descender came to Tibet. He's old, bro. But even with his age, he is still far from being the most powerful being in all of Tibet. But with that being said, he is the most powerful playable character that I personally have on this list, as everyone else above him is simply levels above him. Well, that, well, that was really redundant, huh? <laughs> At number 6, when it comes to the strongest beings in Tevat, I have the God Kings of Sumeru, which, yes, is a group of gods. I got it. It's comprising Greater Lord Ruka Devata, the Goddess of Wisdom, King Desaroth, the Lord of Sand, and Nabu Malakata, the Goddess of Flowers. These deities wielded the powers to create races, which included the Jin and the Aranara. Ruka Devata, in particular, also created the Akasha system, and even Lesser Lord Kusanali to some extent. Their influence over Sumeru is nothing short of immense, and while I get that as Chief having a 3 for 1 special here, I did think they were worth mentioning because the two of them here created their own races which no other god before them could. And yes, I get it, I said Rex Lavis is the assumed creator of the Adepti, but that isn't set as stone, and there's a lot of other theories about where the Adepti actually came from, including their race just having descended from Celestia. So with that being said, what's more godly than creating your own race? I feel as if that takes precedence above a lot of other things, which is why I have the God Kings of Sumeru at the number 6 spot. It should be worth noting that when I say the strongest in Tibet, that doesn't necessarily mean being the greatest at fights. You could also be powerful just in other regards, which is why I have the God Kings of Sumeru here. And now we enter the top 5 strongest beings in the entirety of Tibet's lore. You might be going, huh, well the number 6 spot was just a group of 3 gods. Who could be more powerful than a group of 3 gods? Well my friends, I'm telling you right now, there are some beings on this list in my top 5 who are far stronger than everyone else that came before them, all right? And I will, I will do my best to convince you of that case. I, hey, I'll try, brother. At the fifth strongest being in all of Tivat, I have Alice the Grand Sorceress. Alice, the near omnipotent witch and member of the Hexen Circle, is an enduring character. Her mastery spans astrology, alchemy, and the creation of various inventions like the phonograph and long-form cellular communication. Beyond this, we also know she travels between worlds and is a really strong candidate for being the third descender. This is further backed by her apparent immunity to Ermensoul changes as she knew of Wanderer's background, making her a versatile and timeless figure. Oh, and that group of witches, the Hexen Zirkle, she is the elder of that group and was even mentioned in the same breath of strength as Venti by Diluc, stating that other than him, Alice was the only person who could have organized the events at the Golden Apple Archipelago. So, having not come from this world, she's not bound by the laws of it, so she willy-nilly leaves whenever she wants. She's brought over things from other worlds entirely, and she's the elder and leader of the strongest group of witches in all of Tevat. She's also really old, as she knew Rhyndoter back in Conria, and even called Yai Miku that little kitsune girl. Albedo himself even called her a nigh omnipotent mage. She's strong, bro. She is really strong, and that's just what we know about her, and I would argue we haven't even scratched the surface. She has quite literally explored the entirety of this world. Not the continent to that, but the world itself, which means she's gone beyond the borders of the Seven. She's currently out and about, having left after saying, Tevat's borders have grown fragile these past two years. Looks like Mommy is going to have to get busy. Think about that. Protecting Tevat's border doesn't sound like something any person can just naturally do. As a matter of fact, it sounds like something that only the Divine can do. But Alice herself doing it shows just how strong she actually is. So, I hope I did a decent job at explaining why I have Alice above a group of gods and Rex Lapis and other people, despite the fact that we don't have much information about her. But I think that's the scariest part, is we know all this about her, but yet we don't have the full picture of who she really is or what she really is capable of. I feel like she's worthy of the number five spot. But even Alice has people who are far stronger than her. At number four, I have another group of people. <laughs> it's the Four Shades, emanations of the Primordial One. Crafted by the Primordial One to aid in the war against the Seven Sovereigns, the Four Shades remain enigmatic figures in the lore, with only Isaroth, the god of time and wind known by name. 
However, despite only one being confirmed, other possible shades include the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles and even Paimon. Isaroth was behind the solar chariot falling from the sky and in turn creating the chasm. She is also partially responsible for the creation of the sacred Sakura. Remember that? I told you it was coming back, didn't I? She is what A was referring to when she said Makoto had help from a higher power. So think about it. Even among a god, an archon such as A, Isaroth herself was a quote, higher power. That's kind of nutty. And as I stated before, one of the four shades is thought to be the sustainer of heavenly principles. You know, that one bitch that that just 1v2 the travelers who we can assume were at full strength. I mean, they had their their otherworldly powers. But in addition to that, also has all the gods looking like this. Hmm. Uh, I cannot say. And also just straight came all over Conry. I mean, look at this. Look at this! Having been made for the purpose of helping to defeat the Seven Sovereigns who are the gods of the Old World, these four shades are incredibly powerful as they did in the end win the 40-year war against the Seven Sovereigns. These beings are also incredibly powerful just as a byproduct. To remember before how I stated that Isaroth was behind the solar chariot falling from the sky, this in turn created the chasm. She didn't mean to create the chasm. It was just a byproduct of her power. And that is the kind of power we are in fact talking about here. Beings who just as a byproduct of doing reckless things shift the world around them. It's actually kind of funny when you sit back and think Paimon might actually be one of the four shades, meaning at some point, many thousands and thousands of years ago, she was fighting against some of the most powerful beings Tevat has ever seen, but in the time since then, something might have happened where she lost her form and her memories, and that's why she could be so hungry all the time. But that's just a theory! Okay, get it? Game whatever. Anyway, number three. In the third place for the strongest beings that Tevat has ever seen, this is the last group I promise, it is in fact the Seven Sovereigns. Elemental Dragons of Yore. The Seven Sovereigns, creatures of the Light Realm, once ruled all of the Old Worlds. They were the seven strongest elemental dragons of their own elements, each commanding immense power. Their epic 40-year clash against the Primordial One and the Four Shades marked the birth of a new world, and while some bowed to the Primordial One's might, others sought refuge beneath the ocean's depth, leaving behind their legacy of elemental dominance. A pep is currently the only remaining confirmed dragon of the seven still alive. And that bitch is massive, bro. So massive, bitch had even the Hita shook, dog. These dragons are also some of the oldest being in Tivat's lore, having been here even before the Primordial One. But a lot of the information about them has since been subject to censorship due to the new rulers not wanting anyone to know about them. So while information is relatively scarce, it should be noted that these dragons were the pinnacle in power of their own elements. And that is why they occupied the number three spot. And for all the people who hated me including groups onto this list, don't worry, the next two individuals are in fact just that, individuals. At the number two spots, I have the second who came, also known as the Sinner. While the identity of the second Descender remains shrouded in mystery, odds are he is the crystal that called himself the Sinner, also known as the Abyss, but his real identity could potentially be that of the Dragon King, Nibelung. Remember the seven sovereigns that occupied the number three spot? Well, Nibelung was the king of every single one of those dragons. As to how a native of Tevat can be called the Descender, well, sit back, this might get a little complicated as I try to explain this. In the original war against the Primordial One and the Heavenly Principles, Nibelung saw that he was losing, so as a last ditch effort to win the war, he left the world and came back with forbidden knowledge. But the problem is, when he came back with the forbidden knowledge, it's thought that he looked so unrecognizable that people saw him as a being from beyond. Despite this, Nibelung still lost the war. The war between the second who came and the primordial one was so devastating that it left the earth and the heavens in ruins, as well as the reason that Ankonomiya is currently in no man's land beneath the earth's crust. But despite being a potential point of worship for the Abyss, who in their own right are very powerful, there is a reason he's in second place, and that's because the most powerful being Tevat has ever seen is the primordial one, the creator of all. At the very top of the power pyramid, I mean, no real surprise here, is the primordial one, the first descender, a god hailing from beyond this world. This celestial being not only crafted the heavens and the earth, but also defeated the seven sovereigns, a group of elemental dragons of unparalleled might. He also created the four shades, which even by the Archon standards are a higher power entirely. 
creator of the Heavenly Principles. He's the current ruler of Tibet and has a possible connection to the Travelers. Although his identity remains a mystery, he's thought to be Fanes, which, I mean, saying his name doesn't really add much because th th that's pretty much all the only time that name ever comes up is just as a possible identity of the Primordial One. A, a nigga who was straight born from an egg with wings and a crown, bro. This is some fucking... This is some Hunter Hunter shit, bro. This is actually insane. It should be worth noting that humanity was born 400 years after the arrival of the Primordial One. And for a long time, they had a lovely relationship, the two of them they did, before he suddenly just went grrr and just didn't like humanity anymore. Bro, Ankonomiya sunk beneath the waves because of the war. And when they tried to come back up, Primordial One went, hold up. The fuck y'all think y'all going? We want to come up. Nah, y'all good down there. This guy's a dick, dude. Well, there you have it. That's my list of the most powerful characters in Genshin lore. If anything's wrong, feel free to let me know. I mean, if you like the video, then feel free to join my cult and sub so that I can one day fulfill my, my dream of marching through Nowheresville, Nebraska with a lovely group of hooded gentlemen as we lay waste to the potato people. God, I, I it'll happen one day. It'll happen one day.